Today we're speaking with Dave Wharton, and this is on the subject of custodial interference. And joining me with Dave Wharton to my right is my legal assistant, Brian Godfrey. We're going to talk a little bit about one man's experience, which unfortunately is not all that unique when it comes to trying to exercise parent time and then being the victim of custodial interference, trying to enlist the help of law enforcement and the local prosecutor, DA, county attorney, what have you, and what happened. So, Dave, tell us a little bit about your situation with your kids and uh, what your parent time orders are, and then tell us what you've been doing to try to exercise that time. Fine. Uh, my parent time or order is I have normal standard visitation time. Uh, so that would mean, and standard is a horrible term, I hope correct. you'll never use that again. <laughs> But what Dave means by that, unfortunately, is that he gets every other weekend, probably from Friday until Sunday. Just, yeah. Then he gets every uh, you get one night a week. One night a week for correct. three hours, and then he and his ex split holidays. Yeah. All right. So that's I mean, it's very common. It's becoming less common. That's good news. Uh, joint custodial situations are becoming more common correct, all the correct. time. But you have what's known as the statutory minimum parent time order. Correct. The one minimum. Thing, one thing they have changed is they did stop calling it visitation at least as far as the legislative, and they, they refer to it as parent time, parent which time. is helpful. Normally I don't like switching from one word to two, but yeah, being a visitor to your own kids is a step in the right direction from going away from that to parent time. So, Correct. what do you so I, I actually, like I said, I want to say it was 2012, I got my, the minimum okay. uh, parent time. Uh, things actually went great for about three, four months. Once the court case was out of the court and all the review hearings were done, literally it was probably four weeks. Uh, I go to pick up my daughter one day and lo and behold, nobody's home. Uh, after and were you told in advance? No, not told in advance. So you show up and that's the first you realize nobody's, nobody's home. Nobody's uh, home. Try to make phone calls, try to figure out where, you know, where they are, you know, where my daughter's at. Nobody answers the phone. I uh, show up the next weekend. Uh, you don't mean literally the next weekend, but your next weekend. My, my next have. weekend I have. Okay. Uh, so I show up to, to pick up my daughter. Mom says, oh, she's not here. She's at the aunt's house. And, oh, by the way, I'm not going to let you see her anymore. Uh, and that's because you are a murderer or a drug <laughs> addict. She, did she tell you? No, she didn't. She didn't say anything. She just said. Didn't say she's a, the child's afraid of you, or that no. you look. You appear to have been drunk, or no, nope, nothing. She, Absolutely, she's tired of you pistol whipping her every time no. you come to the door. Nope, nothing. just said just, that I'm not going to let you see her anymore. Okay. Uh, so I actually contacted Eric to find out. Okay, you know this is what happened. What do I need to do? Uh, Eric mentioned to me that you know document everything. Uh, not only document everything, but because uh, this is breaking the law, which is custodial interference, that you can actually get the police involved. So my next step was actually to call the, the Provo Police, actually send an officer over to the house. Uh, we typically met a block or two away from the house and then went to the house together. Uh, literally for the next few weeks that I, you know, every other, you know, every Wednesday and every other weekend, uh, I'd go to pick up my daughter, call the police, they'd meet me somewhere, we'd go knock on the door. At first, they just never answered the door. Uh, I was actually taking my, uh, how do you say, I was trying to pick her up right after school. And then one day it hit me, it's like... Trying to pick your daughter up after school so you wouldn't have to go to your ex's house. Right. Well, I was picking her up tried to get her at school but you know it just so happens those days were the mom days that mom picked her up school early so i'd go to the house and nobody's you know nobody's home at the house well now in fairness did your ex not know what the schedule was oh she knew exactly when the schedule was it wasn't that okay that she knew exactly when it was she knew what she was doing uh when oh i'm trying to sit here and think one time when we went, I'll just give you a couple situations. One time we went, uh, my, I decided, let me back up. I decided that picking her up after school, you can't see anybody's home. You can see the car in the driveway, but with the blinds pulled, you can't tell if anybody's home. 
So I decided. What, what did the police do, even if they hear somebody inside, or think they hear feet padding on the ground? What do they do? Uh, the, well, nothing happened up until I decided to, uh, according to the state statute or whatever, you could pick them up right after school, or you could pick them up at 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. Well, this is December, January, at 5 o'clock, it's dark. So I decided, I'm going to, so I called and left messages and said, hey, you know, I'm changing it to 5 o'clock uh, because of work schedule. So well, I started actually going and picking her up at 5 o'clock. Well, 5 o'clock, it's dark. Now, the first time we went, all of a sudden, the lights are on, but nobody answered the door. Inside the house. Inside the house. The funny part is, is it really pissed off the police officer when he goes and knocks on the door, nobody's home. And then he decides, wait a minute, the garage light just came on. And then it went off. So he decided to go around the back of the house to see if he could see anybody. Uh, of course, because they have a high fence, you can't see over the fence. But when he comes back around to the front of the house, now the light in the front room's off. And uh, Thinking, he, oh, the cop left. The cop now left, right. Now he off the light. Now he, he turned off the light around. and pretend like nobody's home. Right. Uh, that so really. In other words, they thought he left when really he just got around the back of the house. Correct. So they turned off the light, thinking if anybody comes back, it'll look like an empty house. Correct. But he saw the whole thing. Happen. Okay. Right. He saw the whole thing happen. He decided, okay, I'll go ahead and call on the phone. <laughs> he calls on the home phone. Here's the phone ring. Goes to voicemail. Calls on the cell phone. Well, from outside the house, he hears the cell phone go off inside the house. <laughs> so that really irritated him. That's when he actually pulled out his flashlight and started pounding on the door. And basically, he started yelling, yell, this is the police, you need to open your door. Uh, need to say she, the neighbors opened their door, she never opened her door. Uh, so even the neighbors could hear it. Right. Just not her. Exactly. Well, Dave, maybe she wasn't home. I mean, maybe, exactly. she, just, maybe she just, maybe the light spontaneously turned on and off and she left her cell phone behind. Well, he, he, he actually thought, well, maybe, the garage door was like on one of those motion sensors because it turned on about the time I walked by the. Mm -hmm. So he walked over. I literally walked over to the garage window and jumped up and down, and waved his arms, and shined his flashlight in. And the garage door didn't come on and off anymore, so it wasn't that. It had to have been something else. So, uh, needless to say, that things like that happened all the time. Uh, actually, another incident we went over on a weekend. Uh, a female officer actually met me at the, the house. We went up. And she proceeded to say, "Well, your daughter is over at her aunt's house, and that's where she's going to be for the weekend." Um, the police officer said, "You know, it was really nice and polite. Basically, said, well, you know, it's his weekend, so tell us where your where sister lives, is. right? And we'll go we'll pick, her pick her up. No big deal. You know, she's already ready to stay the weekend. Let's yeah. get her stuff and and." Uh, uh, my daughter's mom proceeded to tell the cop where she could go, and how she could stick it, and slam the door on the cop. And uh, after all this, uh, my daughter, needless to say, was quite upset because the cops kept coming over to the house. Uh, so I actually did get a call from my daughter asking me that just don't bring the cops over anymore. And uh, after, you know, talking with Eric just briefly, he's like, you don't have to bring the cops over. As long as there's a police report filed. Besides, the police weren't really happy to be there. And right. they, weren't, they weren't able to do anything. Apparently, you can break the law and then tell a cop where to go. And exactly. the cops won't do anything. Exactly. And, and you know, even uh, there's actually times where I'd be there and she'd drive by and I'd tell the police that that's her. Yeah, here I am waiting in the house. No one's answering the door because that's her car that just drove by. Right. With my daughter in. Well, it's pretty obvious when they live in a cul-de-sac and the car pulls down the cul-de-sac, turns around, and just drives away. <laughs> that's what you would do. So you tell the cop that's her, and he would You'd make a note of it. Right, make a note well, of it. Well, Dave, I'm sorry, this is a sad story, but you know what? A couple of times, three, four. No, it's it's lasted. So you have to think. I had her every week and every other weekend. It lasted from the middle of December till. June. You have it documented for. And now you get to see your daughter. So we actually documented all of them. We actually, my my daughter didn't want the police come over to the house. I actually would go knock on the door, uh, 
just so you know, record everything. I actually went to the house, the first time I went to the house without the police. You know, phones have a video. I just held the phone in my hand and pushed play and walked up to the door and knocked on it. Uh, glad I did, because when I went back to the police station, uh, after waiting at the police station for 45 minutes, the officer finally showed up and he was wanting to arrest me for domestic violence. Because according to her side of the story, and I'm like, whoa, 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 before you do that, I, you need to watch this video. I videotaped the entire thing. And after watching it, it was about an eight minute video. So after watching it, he decided that uh, there was no domestic violence on my side. And that uh, everything she said was stretched the truth quite a bit. And Some people aren't afraid to call it lying. Correct. <laughs> Uh, Bald face flying. And literally, I, I recorded it, kept recording it. Uh, and, and you did that to protect yourself. Yeah. I, as well as to say, you know, don't think I didn't show up. I really did. Every weekend, faithfully, on time. And I've got a video with, with a time stamp. Time stamp, dated. And the words I spoke and where I was and how, how, how much I pounded or softly knocked or whatever it was. So that when she would say, oh, yeah, he came, he came there brandishing a knife. Right. And he kicked holes in my door and all this kind of stuff. Right. I, I did it to protect myself, plus to have video evidence. So, that, yeah, because, and this is important for people to know, if, if you don't do that, then what will happen is, is the other parent can say, what do you mean I'm, I'm committing custodial interference? He hasn't shown up for four visits. He hasn't shown up. And then you're like, that's, that's ridiculous. I've got proof that I was there. And that there's, I'll admit, there are several times I went. Well, with the video camera, walked up to the door, knocked on it, rang the doorbell, turned around and showed there's no car in the driveway, and turned around and left. But that's, that's important because at the very least it shows I was there. Okay. So that she can't say, or whoever it might be your ex, uh, well, he didn't come. Okay. That's why nothing happened. Well, and as Not soon as, me withholding anything. Okay. Just, as soon as I left, I would actually get on the phone and call the, the Provo Police Department. and Because uh, typically it takes a little while for him to finally get somebody to help you. So, you, you right. just tell them I'll meet you at the Provo Police Department. About the time I got there is about the time somebody would actually come out to help you. Okay. So well, it saved, saved time on my part to call as soon as I left versus waiting to get to the police department. At this point, we'd like to thank the Provo Police Department for all the help they have been to Dave. But we can't because they haven't been a great deal of help to Dave. Uh, they did appear. It's not as mm -hmm. though they didn't. Uh, in fact, well, we have. We have. I think what it's, is that? Probably about an, it's 30, maybe three 30, quarters of an inch. Thirty of different paper. police reports filed right. by the Provo Police about Department. About a year's worth of documentation, right? right? And so six months. Six months. That's so, only six months. That's only six months. Okay. Now, <clears throat> there's only so much the police can do. Dave is actually, believe it or not, fortunate that the police would come in response. Part of that, I would think, is that you had documentation, Correct. so the police couldn't. Arrest right. you, or call you uh, that, that you were disturbing the peace and disorderly conduct and all that kind of stuff because you just said I'm showing up, knocking on the door, right. and making my report. I showing up, knocking on the door, yep. and making my report. Uh, if my ex tells you anything else, she's lying, and I'm not. I'm, I'm obeying the law, and I'm entitled to this time. So, <coughs> did the police try to kind of? And I don't know if they did or not. This is a question I right. do not know the answer to. Did they try to discourage you from calling and making these reports, or were they pretty good? Uh, they were actually pretty good. Uh, I found out that if you just call and say, I want somebody to come for custodial interference, they typically give you a hard time. Okay. But So if you call and just say, hey, I need somebody to come keep the peace. My ex-wife and I aren't getting along, and I don't want this to be blown out of proportion. They're more than willing to come help then versus just to come pick your daughter up. I've been told by police that it's because they have to fill out so much paperwork. And I mean, I try to be sympathetic to that, but isn't it their job? I mean, I was a security guard. I filled out a lot of paperwork. And yes, although sometimes I'd roll my eyes, oh no, somebody stole right. something from a locker. But it's your job. It's part of your job to fill those reports out. Correct. To document what happened. So mention custodial interference and they resist, okay. but... To keep the peace. If you say keep the peace, and that's one thing I found out. If you just call and say, hey, I need somebody to keep the peace, and, you know, they would send somebody out, 
there was two or three times where, you know, it's not a top priority for the police department. So there's one time where there's some accidents on the freeway and all the police are busy. <clears throat> you, you just have to totally understand, understand. that you, this isn't right. a priority. So sometimes you might have to wait. Sometimes, right. unfortunately, sometimes they didn't even show up. Let me ask you this. Of, of the, is it about 30 reports you said? Yeah, it's about 30 reports. Of the reports. 30 reports, how many of those um, are fabricated by you? Yeah, absolutely none of them. They're all... No, maybe you didn't understand. Oh. I, uh, how <laughs> many of them did you falsify when you... Re no, absolutely none of them. Well, let, let, I mean, let me put it another way. I mean, <laughs> clearly nobody could get away with 30 different incidents of reported custodial interference without somebody taking action. So, I mean... Well, just, you know, it's... Just, I know, I understand just, exactly. Just confess <laughs> and tell, I mean, you know, it's time to come clean. Right. No, it, it's funny how you really, can have all, so all, much... All 30 of those really happen. Yeah, they're all, they're all, and they're not fabricated by me, they're not fabricated okay. by the police officer, okay, they're well, actually... Then, here's my next question for you then. All right, so <clears throat> when was your ex prosecuted for all 30 of these violations? Well... She never was completely prosecuted. I did after talking to uh, Mayor Curtis mm -hmm. and actually, actually talking to the prosecutor. I'd call him once a month, find out what was going on. Uh, you know, literally, I hate to say it, the first three or four months the city prosecutor basically just blew me off. Because- What? Right, you know, well, the secretary didn't file them right. It was the- there was always an excuse of why. Well, finally, after talking to Mayor Curtis, they finally decided to uh, look into it. And uh, after a month or two, they finally decided to actually press charges for custodial interference. Mm -hmm. uh, it started with three. So do they have a policy that the first, that, you know, as, as long as you get to 25 or more, <laughs> then you qualify to have a... Uh, you know, I wondered the same thing. It's just, I even asked him, you know, how much more does somebody have to break the law before they get charged? Uh -huh. uh, what did the secret? I mean, what did the prosecutor tell you? Uh, he just basically said, "Well, you know, this is something we normally don't, you know, prosecute somebody for, depending upon, you know, the severity." He had all these excuses, basically, depending upon all these factors. Mm -hmm. uh, they finally ended up, like I said, filing some against her. It started out with like three. So 30 reports isn't severe. Right. Well, I, well, the, the thing is they, they at least filed on three and then they bumped it up to six before her court day. Uh, here's the funny part. So then one, she didn't one show fifth of the reports actually. Right. Okay. Well, then the funny part is, so she showed up to one court date. They set a pretrial hearing and she didn't set up, show up for the second one. So. So if you when don't show up for court, her. what happens? Yeah. They, um, well, they put they out put a, a warrant, warrant for, for arrest. arrest. Yeah. And uh, it was a, I literally was there in court. They turned around and said it was a, a cash only bail. Uh, it was, I think it was, I can't remember if it was uh, 250 or $400 <coughs> plus the filing fee for, for six different reports. Mm -hmm. okay. And I thought, great, finally something's gonna happen. And then I found out like three or weeks later that no, they rescheduled court because she came in and signed a promise to appear. After she paid her? No, she didn't have to pay any fines. She didn't have to pay any filing fees. She didn't have to pay any bail, nothing. She just came in and said, I promise to appear, signed the promise to appear. And they set a new court date. Hmm. All right. So, so. So then when, they took it from six let's and just bumped cut it to up the chase, to right? seven. Yeah. Okay. So what happened to trial? So they actually went. We actually went to trial. No, don't keep me in suspense any longer. Just tell me what happened at trial. And she didn't show up again. Well, then she was found guilty <clears throat> in absentia. Well, they they decided to do another warrant for arrest for seven of them. No, I'm serious. I mean, y'all. No, what happened when she got convicted in absentia? Well, so. She had to go sign up and sign she another thing. She, no. she had to sign another the... promise to appear because she mm -hmm. forgot about the court date. Now I sit back and think if I forgot a court date for a criminal offense. Hey look, I, don't uh, give me that. Nobody forgets something important as a court date. So 
you know better than to miss right. a court date. And if you value your job, and if you value your freedom, exactly. well, then I suggest, Mr. Wharton, that you make an effort, tie a string around your finger, something like that. Well, there's so these little I'm things sure called. your ex had a perfectly legitimate exactly. excuse for blowing off court well, a second time. And I don't know what it was, but I did find out that she did we don't, we don't sign really it. Need to know. We well, don't she, really need to she know. She filed a promise to appear to come back again to okay. court. Uh, so what happened at trial? <clears throat> so, so actually, basically, the prosecutor asked me several times, what do you want to see out of this? And I'm like, I only want to see one thing. I want to be a dad. You know, I have a right to be a father to my daughter. I'm like, that's all I'm, that's all I'm not, asking for. Not if the police have bigger fish to fry. So I find out uh, a month later, I call to find out. Okay, ah, when so you is, tell us what happened When's the court date? All right, so what happened at trial? They decided to go ahead and dismiss all seven charges. Well, that's disappointing, but... Uh, seven of the yeah. 30. Right. Well, they didn't, uh, the 30 police reports, they at least, I at least got them to file seven yeah. charges against her. Right. And they, the thing that irritates me about this the most is it's like, you know, the charges they file is, is, is a class B misdemeanor. Yeah. So it would be like driving without a driver's license. Yeah. Maybe. But, but, but I mean, but what I need to understand, so, so what did you do to make this process break down? Absolutely nothing. No, maybe if you misunderstood. <laughs> so why is it your fault that she was not convicted? You know, I, I wish I could think of something I could have done to, but I don't know. Well, the legal okay. the legal so, system so, itself. Okay. All right. Well, then after the charges were dismissed, what did the prosecutor say the reasons were? Um. I'm I actually called the prosecutor, and I haven't heard the word back yet. So I left a couple messages and decided that, you know, need to... Uh, okay, so did they cut her a deal? Did they tell her something no. like, if she promises never to commit custodial interference again? A according to the secretary her. at the city of Provo, or the city prosecutor's mm -hmm. office, they dismissed it with nothing because so she literally because just, she took a class. class no classes well, because she promised she wouldn't commit custodial interference anymore I, you know all they said it was it was dismissed that's because all she paid they a fine. no she she said they because i asked did she pay a fine does she have to do anything is there any classes she have? nope they just dismissed it but at least you get to see your kids or your your daughter now right yeah <laughs> Yeah, uh, it, so, it's well, and it's not because of anything the city of Provo did. Well, uh, hey, aren't you being a little hard on the city of Provo? Uh, you yeah. know, I, I see exactly what you're saying. I just wish that they would just there's well, a law it, in place. If it wasn't the city of Provo the that did this for you, then why, why do you get to see your daughter now? Because we had to hold her, hold her feet to the fire and go to civil court and in. She did decide to actually, instead of going to court, mm -hmm. we actually settled out of court. And if she doesn't allow me to, if she doesn't follow the visitation, then she could spend 30 days in jail. After issuing a warrant for her arrest. And <laughs> then she probably She'll just sign a note. And, yeah. Right, and sign a note. And I, like I said, I. That's not normal. So is she actually afraid of going to jail? In all seriousness, um, because I got to tell you, I wouldn't be right. I, I that's after, after all I've been able to do. Oh, I mean, I I, I blow I blow my ex husband off thirty times. Okay. Well, and those are the ones I have police report, reports right. for. At least, okay, Some so of them didn't even file at a least report. Thirty times, even though you asked them to. <laughs> then it takes forever to get charged. Then I do get charged. Then I blow off court not once but twice, which apparently results in my dismissal Dismiss of my <laughs> charges. So why should I worry? Well, like I said, the worst part is, is it's a crime to, as simple as like driving on an expired license. Well, if you get pulled over for driving on an expired license or an expired tag, mm -hmm. you still have to go to court. You actually, still have to pay. Actually, I, all I had to do was promise to come to court, 
they didn't. And uh, <laughs> promise to show up yeah, and it just and, goes and away. Then, and then they renewed my license for me. Actually. Well, <laughs> the, the, well, the part that just irritates me is it's like, so so it's something as simple as that, but even after thirty police reports. Mm-hmm. You still can't get the police to do anything. Maybe, maybe we're not seeing this the correct way. I mean, maybe the prosecutor's office just realized, you know what, we've got a really high burden of proof here, and we just have to pick our battles, and we just can't, we just can't convict her on even a single count of custodial interference. Well, I've been told, and you could probably attest to it, that mm-hmm. to get a city to actually file custodial interference mm-hmm. is rare. It's like such a small, minute percent that actually gets filed? Well, but I mean, I mean, maybe if you had, I don't know, an even 40 uh, reports, <laughs> maybe that's, I mean, let's cut the, but the it, prosecutor a little slack here. I mean, you got to admit, what, what do you do with 30 reports? I mean... Well, it, I mean, some of those reports might not have been very well kept. I mean... My magic number is 35, personally. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say well, so. in, in, how do I say this? In your experience, how many times have you actually heard a city actually filing charges against somebody for custodian? In Utah. Yeah, Has it ever, well, how many times have you ever heard it happen? I have, well, because I keep track of uh, court dates for Utah Family Law TV reporting correct, efforts. Correct. Uh, one. I don't know what happened. I, I that always, wasn't, and that wasn't I always got seven. Yeah, that wasn't your ex-wife's case either. Of course, was, seven of them was dismissed, but... Mm-hmm. In return for apparently nothing. Nothing. All right. So, we have, the, the, the lesson that we learned from this, the moral of this story is, is that if you are a victim of custodial interference, well, tough luck. Thank you very much, Dave. <laughs> Thanks for coming to talk to us. Thank you.